Hi, my name is Amar Aldeen. I'm Chief Medical Officer of USACS, and today I'm going to talk to you at the High Risk Emergency Medicine Conference about acute aortic dissection and how that can tear a hole in your risk management. Let's get started. So, when we see patients who could have chest pain and could have a diagnosis like dissection, here are five silly things we tell ourselves. And these five silly things, I'm going to tell you, don't make these statements. These are all things you should not do, so let's talk about them because I know we've done them. Number one, the patient doesn't have classic findings of dissection, so it can't be a dissection. Don't say that, that's silly. Number two, the patient is less than 50, so it can't be a dissection. That's silly as well. Three, chest x is normal, so it can't be a dissection. Again, silly. Four, I'm not going to CT everyone for dissection. There's nothing else I can really do, so again, very silly. And then five, I don't want to bother the surgeon for this dissection. I don't think they need to, to, to be called. Another s silly statement there. Let's, uh, let's, let's talk about each of these. So why is acute aortic dissection a setup for litigation? This is really important. Hey, I'm going to go back to that previous slide there. <coughs> I want to do that one over. Sorry. Let's go back to the beginning. Okay. <coughs> Here are five statements, very silly statements that we might tell ourselves when we see a patient with chest pain. Uh, these are things that I want you not to say, and these are things that I want you to avoid. First, the patient doesn't have classic findings, so it can't be a dissection. That's very silly. Classic findings is not the same as sensitive findings. Can't be a dissection? Absolutely could. Number two, the patient's less than 50, so it can't be a dissection. Yeah, it definitely could be a dissection. That's a silly statement. Number three, chest x-ray is normal, so it can't be a dissection. Uh, chest x-ray misses one out of three cases, definitely could still be a dissection. Number four, I'm not going to CT everyone for dissection, so there's nothing else I can do, so that's a silly statement. Definitely there's ways around that. We'll talk about that. And number five, I don't want to bother the surgeon for this dissection. Bother them, okay? Not bothering them is very silly. And the key here is don't be silly. That leads to bad outcomes, bad, uh, bad litigation. All right, let's talk about why aortic dissection is a setup for litigation. So dissection is missed in two out of five cases. I struggle to think of another serious uh, diagnosis where we miss two out of five. Uh, it's very difficult. The, our miss rate for MI, for example, is in the neighborhood of two to five percent. This is two out of five cases, 40%. The other thing is, other deadly causes of chest pain often have well-established evidence-based clinical tools or there's very good sensitive initial testing or a physical exam can diagnose it pretty well. Let's go through some of those. So acute coronary syndrome, we've got the heart score and other clinical scoring tools. We've got our EKG, we've got troponin, we've even got high sensitivity troponin now. We've got uh, coronary calcium scores. There's lots of good data around how to diagnose acute coronary syndrome. PE, we've got PERC, we've got Wells, we've got Dimer, very good clinical decision instruments. Pneumonia and pneumothorax, another cause of deadly, deadly cause of chest pain. Vitals, exam, and a chest x-ray can help diagnose those. Borhov syndrome, good history and a chest x-ray. Tamponade, good history and a good ultrasound. Actually, one of the easier ultrasounds you could do is to look for tamponade. So the other deadly causes of chest pain have initial testing that's relatively sensitive. Dissection, at least up till now, has not been so lucky. Hence, two out of five cases are missed. So let's talk about what the litigation means in acute aortic dissection. It's really important for risk management. So failure to diagnose, about three out of four claims in dissection is due to failure to diagnose. That means that the claims are not at downstream at the surgical end. They are right at the front gate in the ED, in the primary care doctor's office, in, uh, in our urgent cares, these patients are coming to you. The major risk part of it is on you as the acute care clinician. Failure to test, failure to consult, both of those actually are offshoots of failure to diagnose. Now, here are some of the verdicts. Uh, about half of cases, slightly more than half, do go for the defense, which is nice, except that 23% uh, uh, verdicts go in favor of the plaintiff, and then 20% uh, there's, or sorry, 20% uh, in favor of the plaintiff, 23% are settled. So these cases are, are pretty much a 50-50 shot. It's very difficult to defend. 
And the verdict range, and this again is from uh, uh, Palaniapin and Choinsky uh, case reviews of about 135 cases on the one side, 150 in another for dissection. Uh, the verdict range is anywhere from a low 17.5 to $68 million in one case. The mean is $1.8 million. These are big cases and uh, they're easy, as we already mentioned, they're easy to miss. So you got to be real careful with acute aortic dissection, which means you have to be real careful with anyone who has chest pain. So let's go back to our five silly statements. Classic findings, young age, reliance on chest x-ray, uh, nothing else to do besides CT, and then not consulting early enough. Let's start um, and go through them one by one. Silly statement number one, the patient doesn't have classic findings, so it can't be a dissection. That's a silly statement, I'll tell you why. This is from the IRAD data, the Inter International Registry of Acute Aortic Dissection, and uh, this shows you the prevalence of these findings in dissection cases. And as you can see, pain of any kind is very high, severe or worse pain, very high. And then you get down to things like pulse deficit, which is not that common, just, to, uh, just about one out of four cases have pulse deficit. So th these are the things I wanted to highlight for you. Severe pain, 90%, but that means 10% don't have it. Chest pain, 25% don't have it. Uh, tearing, ripping pain, that's a coin flip. So you can have no tearing or ripping pain and still have dissection to, to tune about 49% of times. And then pulse deficit, as I mentioned, only one out of four cases. So the key here is classic findings of chest pain, radiating to the back, severe tearing, pulse deficit. The, that's, that leads us to say, oh, they don't have classic findings? Oh, I can't be a dissection. What I want you to think instead is the patient doesn't have classic findings and it can still be a dissection. Many times, most times, aortic dissection does not have the classic findings. The classic findings may be specific, that is that if you have them, yeah, that's, that could probably is a dissection, but if you lack them, it doesn't mean you can rule out dissection. Absolutely not. So make sure you don't over rely on this notion of classic and keep your differential broad. Let's go to silly statement number two. Patients less than 50 years old can't be a dissection. So dissection does occur. It's uncommon. It does occur even in young people. So this is all comers dissection, three out of a thousand chest, back, or abdominal pain, one dissection for every 80 MIs. Many of you have seen 80 MIs. Uh, I'll bet one of you, uh, I'll bet each of you has seen a dissection or two, and I'll even bet, unfortunately, that each of you has missed a dissection or two. The mean age uh, for, for dissection is 63. Two-thirds of patients are male, and about three-quarters have hypertension. Now, the key here is in young people, it does occur. One out of four dissections is under the age of 53. That means that you're looking at people who haven't even totally qualified yet as middle-aged, uh, one out of four of those uh, uh, dissection cases is under that age. Um, when you're under 40, only a third of them have hypertension. So then your ability to diagnose based on hypertension goes down. Now, the, the good news in some ways is that there are signs in the younger patients that you can help you increase your risk and increase your uh, um, uh, index of suspicion that this could be dissection in a young patient. Bicuspid aortic valve, that's one that you look at on the past medical history, you don't necessarily think much about it. You're like, all right, fine, bicuspid. If they're coming in with chest pain, that's a risk for dissection. You got to watch out for that. Uh, of course, aortic aneurysms can predispose to dissection within the aneurysm. Uh, Marfan's and Ehlers Danlos and other connective tissue diseases. And of course, family history, which could imply that your family has Marfan's and, and uh, you're just incompletely penetrant for that. So the key is, when you're under 40, it's not hypertension that causes your dissection. It's one of these other things. So look out for that. So we concluded that young patients do get dissection to the tune of about a quarter of dissections are under 53. Let's go to silly statement number three. Chest x-ray is normal, so it can't be a dissection. That's silly. I'll tell you why. Let's go back to this table for IRAD, and let's talk about this one. Chest x-ray is non-diagnostic in a third of cases of dissection. For every three chest x-rays you look at with a dissection patient, one of them is going to be non-diagnostic. That's just not good enough. So it's normal in one out of three, non-specific findings. Can you do something other than a CAT scan? Can you send them to MRI land? Maybe, if it's right close by and you have it available, maybe. TTE is not good enough. Transthoracic echocardiogram is not good enough. TEE is often not available enough. TEE is good enough to diagnose it, but uh, good luck getting a TEE in the middle of the night. So if you think 
it's aortic dissection, it could be, do a CAT scan with IV contrast, that's the key. And if you're not sure between PE and dissection, probably do the PE scan because you can get a pretty good look at the aorta with the PE scan. Certainly a better look at the aorta when you do the PE scan than getting a look at uh, the pulmonary vessels when doing an aortogram. So, silly statement number four. I'm not going to CT everyone for dissections. There's nothing else I can do about this. So, in other words, how can we avoid practicing radiation psychiatry? Uh, many of you don't know this, but that's kind of our secondary specialty in acute care medicine, uh, often in emergency medicine, where we use uh, radiation to help uh, mental health of uh, our patients and alleviate anxiety. We're going to stop that practice, and we're going to avoid, uh, we're gonna avoid uh, ordering unnecessary radiological studies. Uh, and here, I'm going to help you out here and, and show you how. So this is the aortic dissection detection score, or ADD score. And when you combine this with the D-dimer, you can actually have a, a very good clinical decision tool to help you eliminate the need for CAT scan in aortic dissection. The ADD score looks at three big categories, past medical history, history of present illness, and physical exam. And it asks you to select to see if there's any one of these uh, uh, elements that are listed there in each category. So for on the past medical history side, Marfan disease, uh, family history, aortic valve disease, we talked about bicuspid aortic valve, that would qualify. If you get any one of those elements in that category, that counts as a point. History of present illness, that's when you take, so you got the risk factor of the past medical, then you go to what do they come in with now? Is the pain abrupt or severe? And is it one of those qualities, tearing, ripping, sharp, or stabbing? If, it's, if you got abrupt or severe, and one of those other four, that counts as a point. That will give you a point in the ADD score. And then the third thing is exam. What do you observe in the patient? So you had the high risk at baseline. You had what they came in with on the history. Now you got the exam. What do you observe? Is there a pulse deficit? Is there a systolic blood pressure difference? Is there a focal neuro deficit? Is there an aortic uh, insufficiency murmur? Or is there shock? Any one of those will get you a point. When your ADD score is zero and the D-dimer was negative, that was 100% sensitivity in this particular study. Let's go further with this one. I, wanna, I want to leave you with the fact that you should use D-dimer in low-risk patients. I'll, I'll urge you not the super low patients, because then you're going to get these false positive dimers, and not the moderate or high patients, because actually those people should just go straight to CT. So if you have someone with chest pain, abdominal pain, back pain, or they have syncope or pulse deficit, and acute aortic syndrome is in your differential, get a D-dimer. That's a good one to get a D-dimer, and you use the ADD score with it. So if the ADD score is zero, in this particular study, there was one miss in 294 patients. That's an acceptable risk. Obviously, we don't want to miss any, but one out of 294 is uh, definitely lower than the risk that you'd get just by contrast alone. Uh, if your ADD score is zero or one, one miss in 312, that's even better. Now you've added a, a point to the ADD score, but you haven't appreciably increased your risk. It's, it starts, your risk starts to increase when you get to an ADD score of two or more. That's when you get a, a five misses in 113 cases in this particular study, and that's where you have to kind of say, okay, that's too far. So here's how you would act. Look back at the ADD score, past medical, HPI, exam. If there's a moderate or high clinical suspicion of dissection, just do the CT, forget the dimer. It's not worth it. It's like a high-risk PE patient. Don't get the dimer, just go straight to CT. If the ADD score is two or more, just get the CT. It's too high risk. Don't, don't, uh, don't mess around with the dimer. If the D-dimer is positive, let's say the ADD score is zero or one, you get the dimer, that's when you should do the CT. And here's the one where you can hold on the CT. The ADD score is a zero or one, and the D-dimer is negative. Then you document your ADD score, document your dimer negativity, and you can hold on a CAT scan. You don't have to CAT scan everyone, but you do have to make sure you're doing a structured clinical evaluation. <coughs> silly, silly statement number five. I don't want to bother the surgeon for this dissection. Well, bother them in the right, in the right uh, cases. So let's go back to the pathophys. There's a tear in the tunica intima. It gets into the muscular tunica media of the aorta. False lumen forms, and then you get an increase in spread. High blood pressure will further increase the false lumen and the tear, and each time your heart pumps, as in when you have a high heart rate, you're going to get blood flowing into there. So you want to try to reduce the blood pressure. You want to try to reduce the heart rate. Classification is important on the management side. 
There's the Stanford classification, A for ascending. That is two thirds of cases and that requires surgery. Of course, you have to medically manage in the meantime until you can get to surgery, but ascending dissection cases almost always require surgery. So that's an immediate bothering the surgeon kind of phenomenon. Uh, and then the Stanford uh, B class is for not ascending, that is past the aortic arch. It's a third of cases. Notice I said B is not ascending. If it's ascending and descending, it's actually an A. So if it's ascending at all, it's an A. If it's not ascending at all, it's a B. That's, this is about a third of cases. That could require surgical management through endovascular means. It depends on your institution. In some cases, that'll be vascular surgery. In some cases, that might be IR. But the point is, is it does require specialist consultation. Uh, but in many cases, they may defer to pure medical management. Here's a picture on a CAT scan of a dissection. You can see the TL, which is the true lumen. And you can see the true lumen of the aorta is getting kinked in by that false lumen. That's that bigger one up on the top image and the, bi the bigger one on the bottom image there with the arrow pushing into the true lumen on both sides. So you can see this is, this is a case where the, the true lumen is, is kinked off. All the perfusions going through that true lumen, the more that gets kinked, the less your brain uh, has blood, the less the rest of your body has blood. And then when the acute aortic dissection, when it ascends, so if it's a Stanford A and it's ascending, at some point it stops ascending because it's into the pericardium and you get an immediate rush of blood, and that will cause pericardial tamponade and syncope. So if someone has chest pain and syncope, you have to think, oh my gosh, this could be acute aortic dissection, and this is exactly how it occurs. So let's go back to management as a summary. Stanford A, ascending, surgery. Stanford B, endovascular therapy or medical therapy. Certainly still that could be surgery, uh, but depends on your institution. You want to rapidly control your blood pressure and heart rate, and uh, you want to avoid anticoagulation or fibrinolysis. Of course, aspirin might be okay. It's probably already given by that point, but you want to make sure that you're not adding heparin or certainly TPA or anything like that. Uh, let's talk about the medical management here, keeping the heart rate less than 60, the systolic blood pressure less than 120. Those are the keys. I like to start with labetalol, 20 milligrams IV, nicardipine, I'll add that on as a drip, five milligrams an hour, and you can titrate that up. You can also give hydralazine, and then you can go to esmolol or even nitroprusside. Nitroprusside ha may have some problems uh, with administration of it, but it's still a very effective tool. Um, you should avoid nitroglycerin. Uh, nitroglycerin will cause a reflex tachycardia, and you want to avoid tachycardia at all costs. That's why I like to start with the beta blocker and add the calcium channel blocker, rather than going to nitroglycerin, which will then increase my heart rate, and I'll still I'll be trying to catch up from that. And then you want to avoid oral agents. These are all IV agents, the ones that I have listed here, the five. Avoid oral agents, unreliable absorption, unreliable effect, too delayed onset. This is an IV situation. Often this is an ICU situation. So let's go back to our five silly statements, and I hope you don't make these statements after this lecture. Number one, the patient doesn't have classic findings so it can't be dissection? Yeah, absolutely, it can. In fact, most patients with dissection don't have classic findings. The classic findings can help you to diagnose in and to rule in, but it cannot help you to rule out. So don't rely on that to rule out. The patient's less than 50, so it can't be dissection. One out of four patients are less than 53. Definitely can be a dissection. Look for some of the high risk features. The one that's common, more common than the others and frequently missed would be bicuspid aortic valve. Chest x-ray is normal, so it can't be dissection. We said already, chest x-ray misses one out of three cases. Do not rely on chest x-ray to rule out dissection, just like you do not rely on classic findings, and you do not rely on age uh, 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 cutoffs uh, to rule out dissection. Chest x-ray can definitely miss it to the tune of one out of three times. I'm not gonna CT everyone for dissection. There's nothing else I can do. Yeah, there is. There's a structured clinical exam it's called the acute, it's called the aortic dissection uh, detection score, the ADD score. And if, when you combine that with a D-dimer, you can help uh, rule out dissection and rule out the need for a CAT scan. A uh, CAT scan is the, is the standard uh, test of choice. Uh, not doing uh, a CAT scan puts you at risk for a number of, uh, uh, um, uh, a, a risk of, of missing the diagnosis. You don't want to do that. So really, it's, the question is to CAT scan or not to CAT scan. And then I don't want to bother the surgeon for this dissection. If it's a Stanford A, you're bothering them. And if it's a Stanford B, you're probably bothering them as well because you want to check to see whether or not 
endovascular management is needed. Either way, you're going to control their heart rate, you're going to control their blood pressure until the surgeon gets to them. But definitely, definitely don't worry about bothering the surgeon on this one. They expect to be bothered on these. Bottom line on this, for acute aortic dissection, always keep it on your differential for chest pain. It is very commonly missed, two out of five cases missed. That means that you're at very great risk of missing it. Don't miss it. The number one reason to miss it is not having it on your initial differential. So have it on your differential and rule it out. Just think about it and document why you don't think it's necessary to do any further testing or why your, the pr present course of testing is going to be adequate to rule it out. If there's any questions, please, please feel free to email me. My email address is there. Thank you very much for your time.